This episode sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes free with Nebula. Details are in the description box below. Hello and welcome history buffs, my name is Nick Hodges and we're back again with another look at Narcos. In this episode I'll be covering Season 2 and the final instalment of the Pablo Escobar story. In the last 17 months of his life, an animal is never more dangerous than when it's cornered and that couldn't be truer in this case. After escaping from his luxury prison, Escobar would declare war on his own country for the second time and did everything in his power to break the will of its government, just as he had done before. In a relatively short period, even more blood and carnage would be inflicted on the Colombian people. In the midst of all this violence, Escobar found himself surrounded on all fronts by the DEA, Search Bloc, the Cali Cartel, and the rise of a new enemy unlike any other he had seen before. But in Netflix's portrayal of the greatest manhunt in history, just how close did they get to the truth? How accurate was season 2 as a whole, and what was embellished for drama and pacing? Well, my fellow history buffs, I will reveal all this and more episode by episode as I cover the final days of Pablo Escobar. This is Season 2 of Narcos. Wednesday, July 21st, 1992. It's around 11 o'clock at night, and the entire mountainside of Envergado, Colombia is surrounded by soldiers. And they're all on the lookout for just one man, Pablo Escobar, the billionaire drug lord and narco-terrorist who just escaped from his luxury prison, although nobody knows that yet. It won't be until after 4.30am before the prison is stormed and the alarm raised. But even so, an entire brigade with about 4,000 men stood between Pablo and freedom. There was no way out, except through them. Señor Escobar, lo siento, pero tenemos órdenes de no dejarlo pasar. Tenemos que ponerlo nuevamente bajo custodia. Qué pena con usted, mijo. Desafortunadamente, yo no puedo permitir eso. I know what you're thinking. They have him in their crosshairs, this man who's killed thousands of people, and yet they hesitate. Surely Netflix is making this up. Well, it wouldn't be the first time something like this has happened in history. When Napoleon Bonaparte escaped from his prison island of Elba, he too was faced by the French army. They were ordered to shoot him, and yet they also hesitated. Not only that, but they laid down their arms and flocked to his side. These were both men of mythic proportions, so I totally buy something like this happening with Pablo Escobar. That maybe the soldiers he faced were too intimidated to stop him. Con su permiso. There are, of course, other accounts of how he escaped. One was he bribed his way out, disguised himself as a soldier. The army even pushed a narrative that Escobar dressed up as a woman, but I don't see how that's supposed to make a difference. If the mountain was meant to be on lockdown, I think that was just an attempt to slander him out of embarrassment for letting him just walk out. Ni una palabra de esto a nadie entendido. Speaking of humiliation, no one was feeling the sting of it more so than President Gaviria and his administration. Within a few hours, Colombia had become the laughing stock of the world, and heads were gonna roll. Now, we don't see too much of this blowback in Narcos, most likely because they just want to keep the story going, but I thought it'd be interesting to point out some of the repercussions. Like how all the army officers at the prison were fired, General Orisa was fired, as well as the Air Force General. Remember all those delays at the airport when Mendoza and that special forces team were stuck waiting around for hours? Well, that happened under his watch. However, the finger pointing wasn't only limited to the military, the focus of the blame would even shift to Eduardo Mendoza, the Vice Minister of Justice. Soon accusations from the media would pop up that Mendoza hadn't flown to Escobar's prison to transfer him, but to warn him. That he told General Reza not to go in and arrest Escobar and volunteered himself as a hostage to buy the drug lord time to escape. Soon Mendoza found himself under criminal investigation by the Attorney General Gustavo de Grief. With all the negative press surrounding Mendoza, he was quickly forced to resign in disgrace. Now, all this happened within a week of the prison break, but in the show, this doesn't take place until episode 4. And another big change Narcos makes is they have Mendoza's character, Eduardo Sandoval, offer to resign himself. Vamos a decir que fui yo quien entró unilateralmente y sin ningún tipo de autorización a la catedral. Ha sido un verdadero honor haberte servido. 
ti y a todo el pueblo colombiano. Unfortunately, Mendoza's exit from politics was nowhere near this amicable. In real life, he had no choice. Ostracized by his friends and the public, he became unhirable overnight. Mendoza had to leave Colombia, and by the end of 1993, he was working as a foreman in a Miami warehouse. Fortunately, his name was cleared in the investigation, and many years later, he reunited with Gaviria, who hired him as a lawyer, settling their past differences aside. But until then, Gaviria was pissed. Later on, when the public found out just how luxurious the prison was, his approval ratings dropped from 79% down to just 22. There was no way back from this without capturing or killing Escobar. First thing Gaviria did was to put Medellin under martial law, doubling police presence on the streets doing door-to-door -door searches, and setting up vehicle checkpoints on almost every corner, especially the barrios. Everybody knew Escobar would re-establish himself there, and Gaviria intended to make life as difficult for him as possible. The only ones smiling out of all of this were the Americans. With Escobar in prison, he had been virtually untouchable, but now that he was out, the hunt was back on. The very next day after Pablo's escape, DEA agent Steve Murphy and Javier Peña was sent to La Catedral to collect as much evidence as possible. And I have to say, this whole scene is very accurate. They found 500 copies of Pablo's self-published leather-bound scrapbooks, each one signed by him and his Sicarios, containing every article and newspaper cartoon written about him. For someone who tried to wipe out all trace of his criminal past and always protested his innocence to the media, it's clear he secretly loved loved his celebrity gangster image. He even had framed photographs of himself dressed up as a prohibition bootlegger. They also found stacks of porn mags, sex toys, mobile phones, and radios. But the best part about this scene is Narcos recreating that famous picture of Murphy and Peña. <laughs> <laughs> After Murphy and Peña scoured the prison for every piece of intel, it was off to the Carlos Holguin School in Medellin to set up shop. The police academy had been repurposed as the official command HQ for the Escobar manhunt, and Murphy and Peña were going to spend much of their time working and sleeping there. Unfortunately, the new leader of the search bloc, Colonel Lino Pinzon, was nowhere near up to the challenge as his predecessor. He was something of a vain and self-important man, more interested in military etiquette and rank than actually doing the job. And instead of welcoming American support and their unlimited resources to find Escobar, he preferred instead to show who's boss. As a courtesy to your government, I'm allowing you to participate in this manhunt. But I set the limits and all decisions rest with me. This conditions are unacceptable. Take it up with the president. Of course, Coronel. I hope we didn't get off on the wrong foot. Not at all. Every operation is a well-defined hierarchy. Now, if you're wondering what happened to Colonel Hugo Martinez, well, after Search Block was disbanded as part of Pablo Escobar's original surrender deal, Martinez was awarded a post in Madrid as a military liaison to Spain, despite the show saying that he was exiled. Anyway, almost immediately, Murphy and Peña started begging their boss to find a way to bring him back. Their lack of confidence in Pinzon would soon be validated. Since I have your attention, I thought I'd mention that whilst my Narco Season 2 review will be split up into parts 1 and 2 on YouTube, you can watch it now in its entirety over on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service made by creators, where we release content early, ad-free, and even show exclusive Nebula originals that you can't find anywhere else. It's also a platform without the restrictions of advertiser-friendly policies you'd find elsewhere. So basically, any videos of mine that need to be heavily edited or go missing will have no problem being uploaded to Nebula, the way they were meant to be Scene. And what's more is that Nebula comes free with CuriosityStream, which is a subscription streaming service that has nothing on it but documentaries, including history, and you can get them both for just 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 for an entire year of content. So if you want to watch the full Narco Season 2 review right now, just go over to curiositystream.com forward slash history buffs. Following Pablo's prison break, he tried everything he could to renegotiate going back inside. He liked living as king of the mountain, and the last thing he wanted to do was to go back on the run, always looking over his shoulder. So he told his lawyers to reach out to the government so he could resurrender. At first, he demanded the same deal as before, to finish his incredibly short sentence at La Catedral. But once he realized that ship had sailed, he compromised just any old prison, as long as it was in Antioquia, his home turf. 
Now, much to the Americans' delight, Gaviria flat out refused. His reputation was in tatters, and if he tried to make another deal, he'd be committing political suicide. But not everyone in his administration had that same issue. Now, Gaviria had made it clear that the government was not to negotiate with Escobar. But Colombia Attorney General Gustavo de Grief didn't give a shit what the president wanted. Unlike the US, where the attorney general is appointed by the president, in Colombia, the Supreme Court chooses the attorney general, whether the president likes it or not. Despite Gaviria's stance, Gustavo de Grief publicly announced he was willing to bargain. And why not? From a career-making standpoint, he had everything to gain and nothing to lose by peacefully bringing in Escobar. He'd be the hero, and if that made Gaviria look like an idiot, even better. It might even guarantee him a ticket to the presidency. So when Escobar heard about this dissension in the ranks, he decided to capitalize on this by reaching out to the press. And the interview we see Pablo give here in episode 2 really happened, and it's almost word for word. Yeah. Estoy dispuesto a pagar por este error, aceptando la celda más humilde, siempre y cuando se me respete mis derechos y se me garanticen que no me van a trasladar de ahí para ningún lado y por ningún motivo. ¿Reconoce usted que alguna vez ha cometido un crimen o ha mandado matar a alguien? Esa respuesta solo podría dársela a un sacerdote. In un confessionario. The only differences with this interview and the real one is that it took place in September 1992 and not immediately after his escape. Also, Pablo didn't do this interview in person but over the phone. That's why this journalist felt brave enough to ask him the hard questions. In this interview and the many others he gave, Pablo continued playing the victim, saying that Gaviria had gone back on his word and that his alleged role in the Moncada and Galeana murders was just a pretext to sell him out to the Americans or his enemies in Cali. He thought a beef between gangsters had nothing to do with the Colombian state, but the simple beef would soon fracture Pablo's empire and escalate into all-out civil war. As Narcos accurately puts it, the Medellin cartel wasn't one big gang, but a coalition of hundreds of smaller gangs, each one owing allegiance and paying tribute to Pablo Escobar in exchange for its protection and connections. But now that the Moncadas and Galeanos had broken away, they were trying to recruit all the other gangs to join their side. In the show, the leaders of the breakaway faction is Diego Murillo, aka Don Berner, and Judy Moncada, the widow of Kiko Moncada. Now, Judy's character is made up. She's only loosely based on Kiko's real widow, Dolly Moncada. When Escobar put a $3 million bounty on Dolly's head, she struck a deal to inform on Escobar. She and her family were flown to America to join witness protection, and according to Javier Pena, when the DEA agents arrived at the hotel to interview her, Dolly and her family bolted. She never fulfilled her side of the bargain. In Narcos, Judy's character is really a combination of other women who fought Escobar from these families. Don Byrne, on the other hand, is based on a real person. He originally started out as a communist guerrilla for the EPL. This career was cut short when a squad kidnapped a powerful drug lord who took revenge and killed everyone in the squad, all except Don Burner, who escaped. After leaving the EPL, he got a job washing cars, and one of his customers was Fernando Galliano, and he took such a liking to Don Burner that he hired him as a foot soldier. Don Burner would prove his loyalty when the EPL tried to muscle in on the Galliano family. Using his former knowledge of the group, he was able to track down and kill the local EPL leader, but not before being shot 17 times and losing his leg. From that day on, he won Fernando's favor and eventually became head of security for the Gallianos. So after his boss was murdered, Don Berna went underground and recruited more gangs to break away from the cartel. Each time one did, Pablo lost more money that he needed to fund his war. To discourage others from following suit, Pablo had to make violent examples when he could, but this eventually worked against him. In the meantime, Pablo's support system was still going strong. Despite all the bloodshed, he could still rely on Medellin's poorest to have his back. Even when President Gaviria appeared on TV and offered a $1.4 million reward and relocation to America for information leading to his capture. Then he had ads running every day with a phone number to call the DEA's tip line. But unsurprisingly, Escobar paid his people to call in hundreds of fake tips to mislead authorities, sabotaging any that might have been real. Fuck me. Marica! Fuck 
Podcast. <laughs> now, interestingly, one of the tips made in the show didn't happen in real life, but I'm not bothered because it creatively brings up one of Escobar's famously weird quirks. It's the bit where Murphy and Peña are told that one of Pablo Sicarios was spotted buying a luxury toilet, which by itself isn't that strange, except when you do a little digging and find out that the cocaine godfather was obsessed with cleanliness. Check this out. In Juan Pablo Escobar's book, Pablo Escobar, My Father, he said this about his dad's habits. He'd then spend up to three hours in the shower. This routine didn't change even in the worst period when he was living on the run and his enemies were at the door. The simple act of brushing his teeth took him at least 45 minutes, always with a pro children's toothbrush. What Steve Murphy and Javier Peña discovered was that in every single one of Escobar's hideouts, even the grimiest ones, they'd always find a sparkling bathroom with brand new fixtures. This is a great authentic detail of Pablo's character, and in the show, Javier Peña looks into where this toilet was bought and asks Centrospike to do a flyover in that general area. Now, although this tip didn't happen in real life, it is true that Centrospike picked up Pablo's location in a flyover. They tracked him down to a hilltop finca, and frustratingly, what's also true was the lukewarm reception this intel got when it was brought to Colonel Pinzon. He saw it as just another lead to add to the pile, and gave it no more credence than the dozens of others that came in every day. And when the Americans pushed him to take this one seriously, he stubbornly refused. Please, Messina, apparently, you think that my hombres trabajan para usted. Está equivocada. Yo no trabajo para usted. Yo decido cómo vamos a trabajar juntos, que es distinto. So just a quick thing to mention, the woman we're seeing there is a character brought into season 2 called Claudia Messina, and she's assigned as the new DEA attaché in Colombia. Problem is that she's made up. The real DEA chief was a guy called Joe Toft. Very interesting character, he was one of the first agents ever assigned to the DEA, and he ran the Bogota office from 1988 until 1994, and was in charge of the bulk of the Escobar manhunt. So you might be wondering, why not just use him as a character instead? Honestly, I think it's because the showrunners felt the cast was looking a bit too much like a sausage fest and wanted to add a strong female character. That's really it. But back to what I was saying. When Pinzon refused to act on the intel, the show accurately depicts the Americans going over his head by calling the US ambassador, who then called Gaviria, who then ordered Pinzon to get off his ass. Something Pinzon did not like one bit. Instead of acting promptly, he took a sweet time to assemble search block and didn't order the raid until the very early hours of the morning. But instead of being discreet, he sent 300 men in a long convoy of trucks and jeeps, making such a racket they woke up the whole neighborhood. Escobar didn't need any advance warning because because their headlights could be seen for miles away, lighting up their position like a Christmas tree. So it isn't any wonder by the time Search Block arrived, Escobar and his family were long gone. From the evidence left behind, not only could they tell he had been there, but he had even used his finger as a hideout back in the first war. Needless to say, the DEA were furious. This Pinzon character was in way over his head, and an early chance of catching the cocaine godfather had slipped through his fingers. From now on, Escobar took even greater precautions with his security. No longer staying in a hideout for more than two days, he'd zip around the city by hiding in the boot of a taxi cab, driven only by his most trusted bodyguards. To make it through the communists undetected, Pablo paid spotters, mostly young kids, to guide him around police checkpoints by using walkie-talkies. He also made sure to do the majority of his phone calls in that taxi too. By staying constantly on the move, it made it that much harder for Centrospike to get a lock on his signal. But even if they did, it wasn't going to do much good anyway. Pinzon's attitude to receiving intel was lacklustre to say the least, even more so as tactics when forced to act upon them. Clearly finding Escobar was only half the solution. If they were ever going to catch him, they needed a change in leadership. What they needed was Colonel Hugo Martinez. Now, as I said before, Colonel Martinez was in Spain at the time, and in the show, what makes President Gaviria desperate enough to bring back the character based on Martinez, Colonel Carrillo, is because Escobar starts killing cops again in retaliation for the failed raid on his finca. They make it seem like he took it personally, like it was a pride or ego thing. But this is not how it happened. In real life, Escobar didn't retaliate against Pinzon because he didn't really mind him all that much. He liked the fact he was incompetent. I mean, yeah, it's inconvenient fleeing your home, but at least you knew when Pinzon was coming. There's a funny story where Juan Pablo Escobar recalls just how little his father cared about the raids. I remember many times, Patron, be careful, the police is 500 meters away. Ah, oh, just bring my lunch and I'm hungry. Tell me when they are 200 meters. Start eating his lunch and, Patron, Patron, they are 
200 meters away. Uh, let me know when they are 50 meters. He was like uh, always a step ahead. He didn't care, he didn't felt any fear at all. So 15 meters before the police arrived, he would just, just walk a little bit and he hide in the woods and he watched them. And once they get away, he, he, he finished his lunch. There's a famous line by Napoleon Bonaparte, which is, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. And if you're Pablo Escobar and you've got someone like Pinzon after you, the last thing you want to do is to get him replaced by killing cops. Because then you're going to make Gaviria desperate enough to bring in someone serious. This inevitably did happen, but not until after two months of Pinzon's apathetic failures and the Americans' constant lobbying to bring back Colonel Martinez, which he did in September 1992. And when that happens in Narcos, there's a fantastic scene where Colonel Carrillo, the character in inspired by Hugo Martinez, lets Escobar know he's back in town by driving into Barrio Escobar and then pissing on the man's mural. Such a cool scene, but I'm sorry to say completely made up. In real life, Colonel Martinez got under Escobar's skin by doing what he did best. First, he focused on whipping Search Block into shape, and once they were, he coordinated with the DEA and Centra Spike to track down, arrest, and kill as many cartel members they could find by launching thousands of raids on their kitchens, stash houses, and hideouts. Carrillo's attacks on Pablo's facilities in Medellin were putting him under more and more pressure. The way Carrillo saw it, each Sicario we took out got us one step closer to Escobar. But it wasn't just Sicarios the search block targeted, it was everyone in Pablo's infrastructure. This included bankers, accountants, money launderers, anyone supporting his organization. And by putting the squeeze on them, they were taking his money and getting a lot of intel. By the end of 1992, search block used that intel to eliminate 12 key players within the Medellin cartel. It was only due to their success that Escobar reinstated the bounty system and started killing cops again. And he often went about this by using two exceptionally brutal methods. One one method he liked was the pistol plan. That's where he had his guys drive through the barrios, handing out guns to all the street gangs and paying them to kill any cops they saw. Another favorite method of Escobar's was to use suicide bombers called Suizos. Technically though, they weren't suicide bombers because they were tricked into blowing themselves up. These were young people who sold small quantities of coke for the cartel. Once they proved they could be trusted, they were later unknowingly carried powdered dynamite that looks just like cocaine. And they were ordered to take through police checkpoints and police stations, and someone else would detonate them by remote control. Escobar had his guys working round the clock making bombs. Each one had been trained by a Spanish terrorist called Chucho, although in the show he's just called the Spaniard. Within two months, over 60 police officers were gunned down, and over a dozen car bombs set off. Pablo's war against the state was back on. Now, one of the big plot points in the show with the character Horatio Carrillo is that when he returns from Spain, he executes a teenage spotter in cold blood and gives a bullet to another to pass on to Pablo as a gift. Pablo then puts this young boy in front of a camera and has him give an interview to the journalist Valeria Velez about witnessing the murder. The story then breaks nationwide, causing a huge uproar, especially when the boy says the Americans were also present. In this case, Javier Peña. Now, whilst not completely outside the realm of possibility, remember when I said earlier that Colombian cops shot a lot of kids during these wars? But this specific incident is fictional. Made up by the writers, they could set up the old classic plant and payoff storytelling technique. In this case, Carrillo's gift, the bullet with Pablo's name on it, sets up a seemingly innocuous but important detail in the story that pays off later when Pablo Escobar and his Sicarios ambush Colonel Carrillo. Mostly wounded, Carrillo looks up and sees Pablo glaring down at him, showing him his bullet. Usted le pidió a un niño que me entregara esto. Se lo devuelvo. Cobarde. Hijo de puta. So two things you probably want to know. Although Carrillo is a fictional character, did Escobar ever kill the head of a major law enforcement unit? And the answer is yes, several times. One was Colonel Jaime Ramirez Gomez in 1986, and another his successor, Colonel Valdemar Franklin Quintero in 1989. So although this scene is fictional, it is authentic. Another thing you might want to know is did Pablo Escobar ever personally lead his troops into battle? Well, according to his son, Juan Pablo Escobar, he did. In his book, Pablo Escobar, My Father, he said, and I quote, On December 21st, one of my father's bodyguards came to check in on us and shared staggering news. My father had personally engaged in several military actions. 
he had two objectives, to demonstrate he hadn't been beaten yet and to inspire the men who were still part of his military apparatus. He continues later with one example. My father had led an armed group to blow up the house in the Las Acacias neighborhood, from which Captain Fernando Posada Hoyas, head of intelligence for the police in Medellin, carried out operations against the Medellin cartel. The procession of vehicles surrounded the house, the bodyguard reported, and one of my father's men placed a powerful charge of dynamite next to the bedroom where the officer was sleeping. When it went off, they searched for him amid the rubble and finished him off. So what I find reoccurring in Narcos is that even in the most fictional scenes, you could still find elements of truth to them. This is clearly not the work of writers who feel restrained by history, but those who wish to pay tribute to it in the most genuine way possible. In the midst of Pablo's war against the state, against Cali, against the rebels in his own cartel, Narcos then introduces new players into the game, one we didn't see back in Season 1. In this case, a far-right paramilitary group called the Auto Defenses, led by the Castaño brothers Fidel and Carlos, and in the show it's explained that the Auto Defenses have a personal beef with Pablo Escobar over the events in Season 1. Remember when Pablo collaborated with M19 communists during the Palace of Justice siege? By doing that, he pissed off the auto defenses, an extreme right-wing paramilitary group that was in direct conflict with the communist guerrillas. Now, as much as I love Narcos, I'm sorry to say, but this bit is bullshit. The auto defenses couldn't care about Escobar's previous collaboration with M19 because M19 surrendered back in 1991. And when M19 became a political party, they made a secret deal with the drug lords, the paramilitaries, and the army that if they supported banning extradition and promised amnesty for guerrillas and their army patrons, then they wouldn't be killed in office. And thus a deal was struck. Another reason why the auto defenses couldn't be pissed off at Escobar's history with M19 was because they didn't even exist yet. The Castaño brothers wouldn't form the auto defenses officially until 1994, after the events of season 2. Although the reason why they formed is true. Their father, Jesus Castaño, was kidnapped by the FARC guerrillas, the largest of all the communist rebel groups. In the show, they say this happened in the late 70s, but it was actually 1981. Anyway, their father was a wealthy landowner and was ransomed for 50 million pesos but his son Fidel only raised 10% of the money. So the FARC guerrillas murdered their father, and from that day on, the Castaños vowed vengeance. Now, the impression we get from Narcos is that the world of paramilitaries is separate from the one of cocaine cartels and Pablo Escobar. But that's not the case. Fidel Castaño was actually a member of the Medellin cartel. That's why his father Jesus was kidnapped. M19 weren't the only guerrillas kidnapping relatives of drug lords. The FARC were also. Now, you might be asking, hey, wait a minute. If Fidel Castaño was a drug trafficker, then how come he only raised 10% of the money? Well, because Fidel hated his father. He used to drink and beat him. All the money raised, Fidel mortgaged off his father's property, and that angered the FARC guerrillas because they expected Fidel's multi-million dollar fortune, but he refused. But what Fidel did use that money for in 1983 was to raise his own private army and go after them. They were called the Tangueros, named after the Castaño Ranch, Las Tangas, and they would eventually become the Auto Defenses. Now, as to why Fidel would do any of this if he didn't even care about his father in the first place? I don't know, I guess it's a Colombian thing. But to raise it, he did, and the ruthless violence they carried out over the years would become the Castaño calling card. Even innocent villagers, who simply lived in guerrilla strongholds, were put to death because they lived under communist subjugation. This bit is absolutely true, but as horrible as this scene is, I can assure you Netflix is holding back. In Robin Kirk's book, More Terrible Than Death, Violence, Drugs, and America's War in Colombia, she describes the atrocities committed by the auto defenses by saying, and I quote, they mutilated bodies with chainsaws, they chained people to burning vehicles, they decapitated and rolled heads like soccer balls, they killed dozens at a time, including women and children. So whilst the Castanios were doing all this, they were still heavily involved in the cartel. For example, Carlos Castani was the mastermind behind the Avianca bombing, the Das Bus bombing, and Galant's assassination too. They weren't outsiders like we see in the show. That's what made them so appealing to Cali, who turned them against Escobar as far back as La Catedral. One of their grievances with Escobar was because he supplied the ELN, another communist rebel group with a huge cache of weapons, in order to sow chaos in his war against the government. The Castaños, naturally being anti-communist, took offense and started to collaborate with Cali, and when Escobar found out, he tried to lure the Castaños to the prison and kill them the same way he dispatched Kiko and Fernando, but they didn't fall for it. 
A month after the prison break, the Castanias held a meeting with Don Berner, the Moncadas, the Galeanos, and all the other rebel gangs. Due to their paramilitary experience, the Castanias took lead in organizing a resistance group. The Cali cartel provided $50 million to pay for informants, weapons, training, and anything else they needed. At first, this group worked in the shadows, but then decided to go public after Escobar carried out one of his most ruthless attacks yet. On January 30th, 1993, a car bomb exploded outside a bookshop in Bogota. Carrying over 100 kilos of dynamite, it killed 21 people and injured 70. Even in a country used to Pablo's terrorism, this was a new low since many of the victims were children. They had been shopping for school supplies before the new semester. The entire nation was outraged. Six months had passed by and still Pablo remained at large. Was this going to be the new norm once again? It took seven years in the first war before the government capitulated. If this administration wouldn't, then all Pablo had to do was to hold on until the next. After all, he had all the money in the world to keep going forever. But what Escobar or the public didn't know yet was that this bombing would be a turning point in the war against him. The next day, four more bombs went off, but this time, they weren't Escobar's. These ones blew up properties belonging to his family members. Several days later, another one of Pablo's properties was burned to the ground. This was not the work of police, but something else. The new group responsible wouldn't have a name until February 3rd, 1993, when the body of a cartel member was found dead in Medellin, with a sign around his neck. The days are numbered, Pablo. No one around you is safe. San Los Pepes. Who in the hell are those Pepes? Well, that wraps up part one of my season two review for Narcos. Stay tuned for part two when it comes out next week. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching, History Buffs.